Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the CDR Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. For those who have been following along for the month of January, we've been celebrating the adventure of a new year. So we've been talking to explorers uh, and adventurers from all over the world who are pushing the boundaries all the time, uh, exploring, trying new things. We've been learning all about things like resiliency and risk taking and all kinds of really cool skills that can help not only when you're planning an expedition, but also uh, when you're in your classroom. So I'm really excited today. We're joined uh, by uh, Katie Miller. She's from Montana and she loves adventure and she's a really good storyteller. She's one of only a handful of female adventurer photographers who are going out around the world to some of the craziest parts of the planet uh, taking pictures. She's a really good skier. She skied many high level routes and first descents all over the world. And she loves traveling as well as photographing the world of ski expeditions. So her images have been in magazines like National Geographic, Powder, and Backcountry Magazine. And she's also Polar Bear International's media and outreach specialist. So Katie, it's so great to have you joining us from Montana today. We're excited to hang out for a bit. And then I know the classrooms are gonna have lots of questions. Awesome, yeah, thanks for having me. It's really nice to see everyone. Um, I'm gonna start off by kind of sharing some slides and some info for 20 minutes or so, a few photos and videos. Um, and then, yeah, we'll take some questions. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. Um, and you will see yourselves for a minute. And I'm gonna open this PowerPoint up. So that's me. Um, when I was a little girl learning how to ski, I live in and grew up in Bozeman, Montana, which is um, near Yellowstone National Park. Um, and when I was a little kid, I just loved to be outside. I loved to ski. I loved to um, bike and raft and adventure. And I had two older brothers that I was always chasing around in the outdoors. And at the time, I never realized how much that would impact me when I got older. I just thought it was something fun that I would do as a kid, um, and I never realized that I would eventually make a career out of it. Um, so when I was in high school, I loved to ski, and I joined a mountaineering team for high school kids called the Junior Mountaineering Team, JMT, and those are two of my closest friends that did it with me, um, the program when I was in high school, and they're still close friends of mine today. And through that program, we learned how to rock climb, how to ice climb, and how to backcountry ski. And what I didn't realize when we were learning all of those things was that I would use those skills throughout the rest of my life. Problem solving, um, dealing with challenging situations, uh, learning how to persevere when things got hard. Um, so that program was really foundational for my life. Um, and I finished that program and I started college and midway through college, I got an opportunity to go to Bolivia. And so I jumped on that opportunity. And when I was in Bolivia, I was assistant guiding a mountaineering expedition. So our goal was to go to um, the high mountains there and climb some peaks. And I was an assistant guide on that trip. But on that trip, I saw other cultures in the world and how differently people lived. Um, I met amazing people that I spent time with. I practiced Spanish, I learned stories. And again, all of these things at the time just seemed really fun. And I had no idea um, how much they would become a part of my career and how I was building skills um, at the time that would help me for the rest of my life. So on that trip, we summited the peak in the background of this picture. It's uh, over 18,000 feet. Um, it's called Pequeño Alpamayo. Um, and that was a foundational experience for me. And additionally, on this trip, I realized that, um, you know, I was going to college, but that I maybe didn't necessarily need to go to college right away, that maybe I wasn't ready to go at that time, and that what I really needed to do was kind of figure out more of who I was um, and what I was interested in and how I wanted to eventually turn that into a career. 
so I came home from that trip and I decided I was gonna wait a little while to go to college and I was gonna go exploring and adventuring and figure out more of who I was, what I was interested in and build different skills um, that again, I would use for the rest of my life. So I'm gonna exit the slideshow for a minute and I'm gonna show you a little video. Um, when I came back from that trip, I went to Alaska and at the time, um, Taking photos and shooting videos was just kind of a fun thing that I liked to do. And I wanted to show you this video because I made this video before um, I was a professional photographer and filmmaker. So this was just me, you know, I was just out of high school. I was about 19, 20 years old playing with cameras um, and, and put together this little video that I look back on now and go, wow, I was really building the skills that allowed me to become who I have become today. So you should hear music. <laughs> able to make a video like that and I bet you can and those are the sort of sorts of things that I started doing um, when I was not much older than you that really built the foundation for the career that I have developed today and one of the crazy things about my job which I'll tell you a little bit more about is when I was your age my job didn't exist um, the job that I have now has been created in the last few years and you know, with technology changing and all of these things, um, you know, I've found that it's just important to kind of follow my curiosity. So after um, I went to Alaska, I was up there and I actually interned with a heli ski guiding operation. So I did a lot of skiing, guiding, learning from other people. Um, and I decided after that, you know, I wanted to keep exploring the world and, and traveling. And so I got a phone call from a really good friend who's a professional skier who's in this photograph. Um, and he said, hey, I'm planning an expedition to Romania. And I would love it if you could come along um, and be the photographer and the videographer. So 
that was my first job as a professional photographer and videographer. And we actually sold a video series to Red Bull and some photos and we skied some lines that had never been skied before. So it was super exciting. Um, at the same time, social media had just started to kind of explode and Instagram in particular um, was sort of blowing up. And we happened to be there, you know, on that platform at the right time telling stories and telling stories in different ways than people had told them before. After that trip, um, I went with that same friend and 12 other people, um, and we went on a ski expedition up Denali, which is the tallest mountain in North America in Alaska. And um, we spent five weeks on the mountain. We had to use ropes for glacier travel. I learned tons about reading maps and weather reports and terrain, but also how to cook for 14 people on a mountain for a month and how to pack a sled and pack a backpack. And these things that I never realized would become life skills. Um, so we actually had about six summit attempts and some of our team had to leave before we got a weather window. But this crew and I finally summited um, on day like 28 of that trip and then after we summited we actually went down to base camp and we got stuck for six days waiting for a plane that could come get us because there was such a big snowstorm um so that was a really pivotal trip and experience in in my life and after that trip i got um invited by Polar Bears International, which is a nonprofit, to go to the Arctic. And they sent me to um, a region of the Arctic north of Norway. It's an archipelago, a group of islands called Svalbard. And I was sent up there to try to take pictures of polar bears on sea ice and to come home with photographs and stories that helped illustrate um, how the bears live on the ice and rely on the ice. Um, so prior to that trip, um, I had loved nature and mountains and, um, you know, being outside, but I really didn't realize um, that the natural world was so important to our day-to-day -day life and that it was actually threatened by things that are happening um, with humans in far, far away places. Um, so I started learning about conservation and about the environment um, and that, you know, we as humans needed to protect these places if we wanted them to be around for a really long time. So I returned um, from that trip. I started doing work for Polar Bears International um, on a seasonal basis. And in the winters, I continued skiing. Um, I loved skiing and I started doing more photography, taking photographs um, for magazines and for big companies. Um, and actually did quite a few sponsored ski expeditions. Um, and a few years after kind of getting my name out there and working really hard, um, I got invited on a really unique expedition. Um, and this expedition was all women. It was six women. And we sailed from Iceland to Greenland. And I'm going to show you the teaser from that um, project. And so I was invited on this trip to take photographs and make a documentary. <laughs> We just arrived in Iceland, and the goal is to sail from here to Greenland and up the west coast, skiing all along the way. It's just crazy to think that like, okay, we have this idea. So this is our team. Pip, Huma, Martha, Megan, McKenna, our photographer Katie, and me. In today's world, we go so fast. It 
it's important to slow down. I don't think any of us knew that we were pretty much sailing into a storm. I was scared, I was seasick. You can't pull over and decide that you want to take a break because it's getting too real for you. On this trip I've been nicknamed Mother Hen. Nice job, stay, stay! Spooky, spooky! Hello, I come from Penotelik, the southernmost Greenland. Our actions on the other side of the planet will affect the people here first. I have a passion for skiing and I have seen in my lifetime that the climate has changed. Usually, you can't reach the coast in the southern tip of Greenland. Like perfectly still water, huge mountains. It was it's breathtaking there. We're talking remote, we're talking exploration, we're talking like real adventure here. And so if you want to watch the rest of that, it's 30 minutes long, it's online, it's for free so that people like you can watch it anytime that you want. Um, and that was just a life-changing trip, a life-changing experience where I got to combine my passion for the environment and my passion for skiing. Um, and it was just one of the wildest trips I have ever been on. So after that trip, I returned back to Montana and I continued working in the summer and the fall for Polar Bears International. Um, and in the winter and the spring, I was doing ski expeditions um, and stories and, and photograph, uh, photography projects. Um, traveling all over and also a lot near my home where I lived. Um, and simultaneously, I began falling in love with the quieter parts of expeditions, seeing animal tracks and uh, listening to the wind and watching the stars and um, really starting to dive deeper and follow my curiosity. What's this animal track? I want to learn more about this animal and why it lives here. And you know, how could I get involved in um, helping to protect these places? And since then, I've come up with little projects. Um, one of the more recent ones that was really impactful for me was um, running, trail running across Yellowstone National Park. So 140 miles, 30 miles a day for five days. And then I got to write a story about it. And through that story, I got to weave together the adventure, but also the importance of the place and what that place needs in order to be protected um, and, and stay that way. So I've developed this niche um, in these different worlds. Um, recently, I took a full-time job with Polar Bears International. So now I am their media and outreach manager, and I get to work with um, all sorts of journalists and filmmakers on creating impactful stories about polar bears and the challenges that they face um, in a warming world. And I also get to take photographs and edit videos um, and help tell those stories myself. So it's been quite the journey. Um, this is a photo of me in December helping um, a close friend of mine who was on the junior mountaineering team with me get ready to go to the climate negotiations in Poland. And I was helping him make a video to talk about why the climate negotiations were important for polar bears. Um, so with that, I will open it up to questions, um, but I just want to encourage all of you to follow your curiosity um, because you never know 
where it will take you. Um, and it'll take you to places that you never dreamed of or imagined. I never dreamed that I would do all of the things that I've done or end up um, where I am doing the job that I do. So I'll stop the screen sharing now so I can see all of you. All right, you're back. Well, thank you, Katie. That was awesome. That was, thank you for sharing your story in that way. That, that was great. Um, I'm sure the students are going to have lots of questions, so we're going to get right into it. Uh, let's see. Our first class, we're going to visit Mrs. Hoxley's class. They are joining us from Independence, Missouri. They're a fifth grade classroom. Let's get that microphone on. How are we doing, fifth graders? Have you ever been injured while a victim? You know, I've never had a big injury while adventuring, actually. I'm very lucky. Um, and I attribute that to being super, super careful. Because if you get injured when you are hundreds of miles from the nearest hospital, it's a really bad situation. So I've done a lot of training um, and courses. I am a certified wilderness first responder, which is kind of a type of first aid. And I've taken um, ski guiding courses and rope skills courses. So I've been super careful. I did get a little bit of frostbite on my toes when I was on Denali. And I still have problems with my toes to this day. So I wish I had been more careful. <laughs> All right, I think that's a really good point. All expeditions take a lot of planning, and if you don't plan for all the situations, you get yourself into a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> good point. Uh, Mrs. Sinclair's class, they are hanging out with us. In, oh, they're in Montana as well, Kalispell, Montana. All right. Yeah, and let's get their microphone on, see how they're doing today. How are we doing, boys and girls? Good. <laughs> Right, Sophia. Um, how old were you when you were um, going to the polar bear job? I started the polar bear job when I was 21 years old, which that might seem kind of old to you all, but that's pretty young. Um, and it was, it's pretty unique actually for, for someone that young because a lot of 21 year olds are in college. Um, and like I mentioned to you when I was presenting, I chose to go get experience instead of going to college um, at that time. And I actually started college again this week. And believe it or not, because I have 10 years of experience, they let me skip my bachelor's degree. I had to write a lot of papers, but they let me skip my bachelor's degree and I'm going straight into a master's degree. So like the second level of college, um, which is super unique, but um, I wasn't ready at the time. So I started that job when I was 21. I did a lot of saying yes to unique opportunities from the time I was about 19 until I was about 26. And now I'm being a little more picky about the things that I say yes to. All right, I think you've earned that right. <laughs> um, no, that's a really good point is sometimes people think there's a right and a wrong way to do things, but there's so many different paths you can take to get to the spot where you want to be or the spot you're gonna end up. There isn't really a right way for for anybody, it's it's whatever works for you to get you to what makes you happy. Mm -hmm, absolutely. All right, let's take a trip to British Columbia this time. We're gonna visit uh, with Mrs. Steeson's grade threes. They're hanging out with us in BC. Let's get their microphone on. How are we doing grade threes? <laughs> KT, one of our friends was wondering, um, how do you prepare for bad snowstorms when you're just out in the wild like that? Mm -hmm. That is a very good question. Well, there's a lot of things you do to prepare. Um, 
the first thing that comes to mind is making sure that you have made a really good packing list and that you have all of the equipment that you need and that you don't forget anything. I actually, just last weekend, did a 20 mile ski through Yellowstone to some backcountry geyser basins. And um, I forgot my headlamp, which was a pretty big deal. But guess what? I keep an extra headlamp in my first aid kit in case I forget my headlamp. And so that's what I mean by being prepared. Um, so, so making sure you have the right equipment that you need. And it's taken me years and years to slowly acquire that stuff. Um, and also making sure you do your homework. So you have um, a really good plan. You've studied your maps. You have maps with you and a compass. Or these days, I carry a map and a compass and I carry a GPS and a way to charge my GPS. And a GPS, for those of you that might not know, it's like an electronic map that tells you where you are. Um, they're super handy. And the other thing I do is I look at the weather forecast and I try to plan the, um, the route for the weather. So sometimes you just don't get to go if the weather's too bad. You just have to stay in one place. Um, and that's where your gear might help, right? Like, so you pack an extra night of food in case you have to camp out because you can't move during a snowstorm or something like that. So those are the three biggest things that um, come to mind when preparing for a trip. All right, great question. Let's take a quick trip to Mr. Lander's class. They are hanging out in Pulaski in the US. They're grade sevens. Let's get that microphone turned on for them. How are we doing grade sevens? <laughs> Trying to stay warm. We have uh, negative 45 Celsius uh, temps tomorrow. Wind chill. Wow. wow, that sounds like the Arctic. <laughs> All right, you ready? Um, Louder. Where did you get like the funding and stuff for your trip? Like, Ooh. That is a good question. Um, funding from trips might be the hardest part, and I have found lots of different ways to fund trips. The big trip that we did when we sailed from Iceland to Greenland cost about $40,000. And we raised that money through a couple different ways. Um, we raised about 25% of it through grants. So we got two really big grants. So we had to write a paper um, about our, our trip and our story and what we were going to do afterwards, like how we were going to benefit the world by receiving this money. Um, so we got a National Geographic Young Explorer grant and we got a grant from Outdoor company called Polar Tech. And then we got about half of the funding through a crowdsourcing campaign, like a Kickstarter. Um, so people wanted to support us doing that trip and they donated. And then we got about 25% of that money through sponsorships from companies. So, uh, like a clothing company would give us a little bit for the trip. And in exchange, we gave them photos and they got to be credited in the video. Um, so rarely do you get funding for free. And that's where building skills like storytelling is really important because you have something that you can provide in exchange for funding. Um, the trip where we ran across Yellowstone um, I pitched that story afterwards um, and was paid for the writing. So even though I didn't get paid before the trip, um, I got paid for writing the article after the trip. Um, and part of the reason I've taken my full-time job now is because it's really hard to make a lot of money doing this. You can break even. Um, and if you work super, super hard at it, you can make some money, but sometimes it's nice to just be like, 
I know I have a job that I'm going to tomorrow. So, you know, life ebbs and flows and you have different phases in your life. And sometimes for me, there was this phase where living, you know, not knowing what was coming next month was really exciting and fun. Um, and then now I'm in a phase where I kind of want a little stability for a while and then I might go back to that. So yeah, funding is a tricky, tricky thing to figure out. All right. It sure is. Uh, let's go to Mrs. Reeves class. They are hanging out with us uh, in Leamington, Ontario, grade three, fours. How are we doing boys and girls? That's good. Hi, my name is Max. Hey, Max, we're ready, bud. How do you get like the close ups, like the polar bear and the other wildlife? Mm hmm. That's a great question, Max. Um, so, the key with wildlife is that we don't want to harass them, we don't want to disturb them or cause them to change their behavior. So um, we use really big zoom lenses on our cameras, and that allows us to stay a very safe distance away from the wildlife, but still get really great photographs. Um, additionally, with dangerous wildlife like polar bears, um, all of the photos I've taken, I've either been on a boat, so I'm like safe up away from the polar bear, or on a tundra buggy, which is like a school bus on monster truck wheels. So you're up in the school bus and you're safe um, and it keeps not only us safe, but it keeps the wildlife safe too, which is really important. All right, perfect. Uh, our final live class, Mrs. Braddy's class. Let's get their microphone on there in Festus, Missouri. They are, where did my paper go? There we go, grade six class. How's everyone doing in grade six? Good. How many polar bears can you see on your trips? Ooh, um, gosh. When I have been um, to the islands north of Norway, we only see a few polar bears, maybe, and you might not even see one. Um, up there, we travel around on boats and the polar bears are often out on the sea ice towards the North Pole. And so they're spread out across a way bigger area um, and it's much harder to see them. So the few times I've gone, I've seen five to 10 polar bears each time. And the work I do in Northern Canada, the polar bears there on the Hudson Bay in Manitoba and in Nunavut and Quebec, um, and Ontario, um, those polar bears, their sea ice melts completely in the summertime. And so they are forced onto land. And when they're waiting on land, they hang out by the shore because if they walk way inland, they're wasting a ton of energy. Um, and so they hang out on the shore and they're really concentrated. So there's a lot of bears in one area. And each season, I might see as many as a hundred different polar bears. Um, and so I've seen hundreds of polar bears over the last seven years working in the Arctic. Very cool, pretty lucky. Mm-hmm, super lucky. <laughs> All right, Katie, well, we still have some time, so I'm gonna try and do a speed round through the classrooms now and see if we can get some more questions in. All right. So I'm gonna jump into Mrs. Hoxley's class. If you guys have a follow-up, your microphone is on. Go ahead, Kate. Kate, she's coming. Hi, my name is Kayton, and my question is, what is the coldest temperatures that you have been in? Ooh, good question. Um, this year was very, very cold, and it was about minus 40 Celsius for two weeks at the end of my field season. So we wear big parkas and big warm boots. Make sure you have hand warmers and toe warmers. You can't leave the house without your warm stuff. Let's jump to our Montana class. Mrs. Sinclair's class, your microphone is on. Um, how did you get shelter? In Greenland. 
Can you say the question again? How did we? How did you get shelter in Greenland? How did you get shelter in Greenland? Shelter, is that the question? Sorry. Yeah, they're wondering how you got shelter in Greenland. Shelter, yeah, okay. Um, well, in Greenland, we were on a sailboat and the sailboat um, was a boat that had bunk beds and a kitchen and an area to eat. So we slept um, on, and traveled on the sailboat. And then we would go from the sailboat into a small Zodiac, which is like a raft with a motor on the back and take it to shore to do the skiing that we were doing. All right, trip to BC, Mrs. Thiessen's class, your microphone is on. Um, another friend was wondering, have you ever been injured on one of your trips? Um, I have not been injured. I've been very, very lucky, but also, you know, luck is a combination of being prepared and being in the right place at the right time. So I have not been injured. I have a little bit of frostbite damage on my toes, but that's about it. All right. Now, to maybe to add on that question, to have anybody you've been with on an expedition run into any issues? You know, I've, I've been really lucky and not had anything too major. We did have a storm um, that we sailed through on that big trip from Iceland to Greenland. And the um, one of our expedition members during the storm her, got hit in the ribs and actually cracked a rib. And it was very scary. Um, you can't do a lot about ribs, so she just had to rest and take it easy. Um, but it could have been a lot worse. Mm -hmm. All right. I know all about cracked ribs. They're they're not good. They don't feel no. good at all. No. Uh, no. All right. Let's go to Mr. Lander's class. Your microphone is on again. Grade sevens. Would you ever take a longer trip than you have before? I would take a longer trip. Um but they're very exhausting and taxing. And sometimes you feel a little bit like, who am I when you get home? Because you go through so many experiences. Um, but I would really like to spend some time in, in northern communities doing some skiing, but also learning from indigenous people um, and trying to find ways to help them share their stories. And in order to do that, I think I would need to spend a lot of time there to build um, trust and rapport so we'll see maybe one of these days all right we're going to leamington mrs reed's class your microphone is on um how were you able to breathe in the highest mountain in north america yeah uh it was hard to breathe but you still can you just have to slow down a lot so normally i could take like a breath um, and when we were on the final steps summiting Denali, I was taking about, um, let's see, I was like taking a step and counting to 10 so I could catch up with my breath and taking a step and counting to 10 and step count to 10. So you just have to slow down a lot, but it's not like Mount Everest where you have to use oxygen. All right, and back to Festus, Missouri. I'll get Mrs. Braddy's microphone on for another question. Well, my kids had to leave. Our bell just rang, but we really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, All right. thank you. Perfect. Thanks for hanging out. Well, Katie, I think that was a pretty good speed round. I think we pulled it off. All right. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for being curious. And, um, yeah, I hope you have a lovely winter and keep learning always. So, Katie, uh, I think your Instagram is uh, KT Miller Photo. Is that right? Correct. Yes. And is your Instagram the same? Yes. All right. Perfect. So, teachers, if you did take any pictures of your classes today, please do post them on uh, Twitter and make sure to tag uh, Katie in it because we love to see pictures of classrooms in action. And, Katie, it was great to have you joining us again uh, as we celebrate Adventure this month. And uh, yeah, I think many students will be looking forward to seeing what comes next for you. Awesome, yeah, thank you all. I hope you guys have some great adventures in your lives too.
All right, let's get those microphones turned on. Boys and girls, nice and loud. If you want to say goodbye and thank you, and then we'll sign off for today. So here we go. All right, awesome job as always. Well, thanks everyone. We have a few more hangouts left this month. And then February, we kick all the men out and we host only women in uh, science and exploration. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. So there'll be a newsletter coming out soon. Again, Katie, thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you again soon, I hope. Yes, thanks. Bye. Bye.